9 a.m. in Beijing and Hong Kong. Welcome to Buba Markets China Open. I'm Yvonne Mann. Our top stories this morning. China heading into the Lunar New Year holiday, stalked by deflation. January data due this hour, expected to show consumer prices declining for a fourth month and a 16th straight fall at the factory gate. Meanwhile, Beijing replaces its chief securities regulator in a surprise move that may signal tougher action to end the market route. And Alibaba's U.S. shares fall on lower than expected sales with weak e-commerce performance and sluggish cloud growth. We'll see if that buyback does anything to offset all the core weakness that we're seeing in the business. But certainly uh, that didn't do so well for the shares in the U.S. That being said, we're, we're focusing on, of course, the bigger picture here. What the CSRC head replaced, there is now a new man in town. And whether that actually does help put a floor on this market is certainly one that we're talking about. Wu Ching, uh, this is, uh, he's known as a broker butcher, is coming back to uh, take, it's in, for obviously, see if they can rescue this market, which they have struggled of late. You know, we, we lost a bit of momentum yesterday, but certainly uh, the Asia market did come back towards the end of the close. You're seeing A50 futures are still positive here right now, so it looks like we could still end the last trading day before this Lunar New Year holiday, 10-day break for China on a positive note. Take a look at when it comes to SoftBank, though that's really lifting Japan this morning. We're 8%. Uh, so the earnings are coming up for SoftBank, but ARM, it was the guidance, the outlook that really lifted the sector, and it's really lifted some of these chip stocks here in the region as well. Pretty slow going. We'll see how the whole China story plays out for the rest of Asia here today. But we're watching volumes very closely given multiple markets are closed. Taiwan, Indonesia, Vietnam and Pakistan today. Singapore flat this morning. We're watching bonds. Now, there was that uh, 10 year auction which did come out with a pretty solid demand. There's a 30 bond year bond auction here today. So maybe that reassures the market a little bit that, that the sell off that we saw uh, in bonds may have been overdone so far. Far. Also, you pair that with some of the Fed speak we've been talking about. Still, March, that cut not on the table here. Kashkari is saying two to three rate cuts may be appropriate for 2024. Dollar is flat. We're not seeing a whole lot of movement, but we are seeing that dollar China back to 720 levels. And we're watching oil markets very closely. You have Shanghai crude up some 1%. Iron ore is also up in Singapore this morning. So let's get to our top story right now. China making a change at the top of its securities regulator in the latest step to halt a stock market slide that's wiped $5 trillion worth of market value from onshore indices since that peak back in 2021. For the latest, let's bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Yep. What does this signal? <laughs> well, they're sending a message uh, ahead of that big long holiday you're just talking about uh, to try and show that uh, forceful measures will be coming down the pike with the new CSRC uh, chairman. Uh, basically, Yi Hui Man had been in the job since 2019. He was the chairman of the regulatory body as well as the party chief. Uh, he will be out. Uh, There's not a changing of the guard necessarily as far as uh, age. They're both 59 years of age. Uh, they're both veterans of regulation. Uh, Wu Qing who is coming in. He is a known to be a hardline enforcer. Uh, he is a veteran banker as well as a veteran of the regulatory framework in China, in Shanghai in particular. Uh, and you're right, he was known as the broker butcher. Why? Well, in the mid-2000s, he kind of oversaw uh, in Shanghai the, the, the closing down of 31 different brokerages. There was some uh, malfeasance and some irregular practices, and he basically led that crackdown. He is known to have zero tolerance. Uh, for violations. And again, if you look back over the last few weeks, a number of the statements from the CSRC saying they found malicious short selling evidence of stock market manipulation. So they're, they're playing this angle, obviously. We need to crack down on some alleged malfeasance uh, in stock trading, uh, short selling. They, they keep on talking about that a lot. So I guess Wu Qing is coming in as the broker butcher. Is he the security savior, though? Mm -hmm. That is the, the, going to be the the, the big question. So that could be potential good news. Uh, we're showing this chart now, which basically in previous yep. times where we've seen a change of guard yep. at CSRC, it's actually proven to be quite successful, yep. right? You bring it back to Liu Shiryu, named CSRC head yep. back in 2016 or so. We saw double digit gains for the yep. two year span. Same happened when Yi Hui Men yep. took over about five years ago. 
So that certainly is something that could help stabilize this sure. market. This is common. You bring in somebody new. Why are you bringing in someone new? You want them to make changes. So they have the enforcement uh, gravitas, if you will. They get the mandate to make some changes. So then there's a, a shape change in sentiment, perhaps, and perhaps some steps put into place uh, to put a floor on the falling of the market. Uh, and unfortunately for the former chairman, E, he gets kind of thrown under the bus as being not doing enough, yeah. obviously. And there has been a lot of market criticism uh, that regulators kind of took a piecemeal approach to trying to find a floor on the market and nothing seemed to work. Because everybody, it, it's again, chicken or egg or horse and cart situation. Is the stock market sinking? Why? Well, there's underlying weakness in the Chinese economy. There is a ongoing property market slump. There is geopolitical concerns. There is weakness. There's persistent deflation, which we're going to be talking about here coming up. So again, it's a tough job to put a floor on a sinking market when the underlying fundamentals are pretty weak. And it's a thankless job, right? <laughs> uh, you know, you talk about inflation data, but certainly, you know, if we see another bad print, which it looks like expected yeah. to be, is that going to be a big headwind for the market? It's, it's stubborn deflation, obviously. I mean, factory gate deflation has been going for 15 consecutive months. It's going to be a 16th consecutive month because there's no indication uh, that there's any pricing power at the factory gate. So PPI will sink again for the 16th consecutive month. Uh, CPI inflation uh, kind of lagging that as the pricing weakness uh, then translates to the, you know, from wholesale prices to retail prices. It's going to be a fourth consecutive month as well for CPI uh, deflation, uh, down about half of 1%. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Sticking around. Joining us now is our next guest, Vaser Ling, Managing Director at UBP. Uh, Vaser, you've been kind of looking at this, the, this new CSRC head. I mean, how big of a yeah, lift right. do you think this is going to bring to the market in restoring confidence now? Yeah, I think like uh, Stephen said, right, uh, when you bring in a new guy, he's given uh, a mission, obviously, uh, to stem the decline. So he's going to come in with uh, positive policies uh, for the stock market, uh, like uh, we've seen in the past couple of weeks, uh, restrictions on uh, short selling, restrictions on stock lending and so on. Um, but having said that, right, uh, ultimately what drives uh, share prices are, you know, the fundamental performance of companies and that in a large part is is uh, determined by the economy, which is not in good shape right now. So he may be able to stem uh, the, the vicious downward spiral through capital market actions. But really, I think for investors to regain confidence, they need to see the economy turn around. They need to see earnings turn around. Or they need to see the outlook brighten. And those are not areas which the new CSRC head is, is uh, in, a, in a position to influence. So Vaisen, uh, the broker butcher, What's he going to likely come in and do? He'll have about a week or so uh, to come up with forceful measures to put that floor on the stock market sell-off. But again, as I said earlier, you need a better economy, right? And I don't think 10 yeah. days over the Lunar New Year holiday is going to change those fundamentals. Nobody's going to be spending you know, their, their no. paper wealth, which has dwindled dramatically. So what is he going to do or what can he do? No, I think uh, it's going to be more of uh, the same. Uh, so similar kinds of uh, piecemeal capital market uh, restrictions and actions that we've seen uh, over uh, the past few weeks and perhaps uh, encouraging more uh, of the national team's uh, participation, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, state-owned banks uh, to participate in the markets. So it, I think it's going to be more of the same. But more importantly, you know, coming in, uh, new guy, new policies, uh, that's sending uh, a signal uh, that the the government is serious uh, about rescuing uh, the stock market, and that in itself uh, is is something powerful. So, Vaisar, what would you be recommending? Right, is is now the time to to be you know adding exposure to to China as as we try to time th this recovery, or at least you know, can we at least say a floor has been put? Yeah, so uh, we are uh, tactically bearish uh, on China. I think. Uh, the, the country is facing structural uh, and economic issues which are challenging to resolve and it is unclear uh, that uh, current, uh, current policies are able to help uh, turn the ship around and uh, so uh, 
Uh, we wouldn't be recommending uh, accumulating or timing the bottom uh, for, for the market uh, right now. Uh, and uh, if there is a, a rally, uh, I, I think uh, the recommendation really is to consider uh, keeping uh, the higher quality exposure and uh, reducing some of the lower, uh, lower quality exposure uh, to China. Okay. Yep, and I think tech is, is part of that too. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Vaser, uh, hold your thoughts. So Vaser Ling, their managing director at UBP. We're going to have more. I also want to thank Stephen Engel, our chief North Asia correspondent as well. Yep, so the inflation data is front in mind really here coming up because you know it is all about the data in some ways of what really could restore the confidence uh, into this market, right? And inflation data continues to be quite ugly, as, as Steve had just mentioned. Uh, what we're expecting in terms of the consensus is a half of 1% drop fourth straight month of negative prints for CPI, 16th month declines for PPI. So if we see, once again, persistent deflation, how big of a hurdle is that going to be in ter terms of restoring market sentiment? So two sort of forces really playing out for markets here today. But yes, the timing of this replacement of the CRC head certainly does show that this situation is getting real right now. And this directive coming from the top in terms of concerns of trying to arrest this route. All right, that's what we're looking at as well. Still ahead, Alibaba's $25 billion buyback. Failing to calm investors worried about the tech giants plateauing growth. We have more when it comes to the earnings coming up and also also cutting down to the open of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Uh, it is, of course, the last day before that 10-day holiday break out in China. How are we going to see sentiment play out here after multiple moves that we've heard headlines about changes, uh, you know, cracking down on short selling the like here. Is it enough for another rally before we end the week? This is Bloomberg Markets trying to open. Good morning. All right. If you take a look at how the ADRs did when it comes to Alibaba after those earnings came out, could be an indication of what's to come in about 15 minutes' time when that stock opens in Hong Kong. 6% drop nearly uh, there, just on the back of what we saw, the weak core business. Uh, they did announce that buyback, which was you know furthering this buyback plus upsizing it, didn't do enough to really change what you know, the, the, the concerns around this company here right now. Uh, also, news of Tainiao, that IPO, uh, put on hold as well. For more, let's bring in Vaser and Ling, Managing Director at UBP, still with us here right now. Vaser, and your take on these earnings. Yeah, I think the numbers show that uh, the, the company is struggling to grow. Uh, so the top line uh, core business is not really growing very much. I think uh, earlier on uh, the past few quarters, uh, it was difficult to distinguish uh, whether that was being dragged by the economy or by, by competition, but it's increasingly looking like uh, it's competition that's dragging the growth. In the early days, uh, Alibaba was able to use uh, its size and scale to grow, but uh, with uh, the anti-monopoly crackdown, it's becoming uh, much harder for them to do that. So fundamental-wise, I think uh, uh, it's challenging, uh, and it remains to be seen whether the company's new strategy will help it re uh, uh, get back onto the growth path. And it really goes to show this emergence of these short video form video players, right, Douyin, yeah. Kwai show. I've really started to gain market yeah. share from these traditional e-commerce players. Should we expect the likes of yeah. you know, the PDDs to continue to do that yeah. in 2024? Yeah, there are a couple of things that PDD does better than than Alibaba, right? First of all, it's very social. Secondly, uh, it addresses uh, uh, the lower tier markets better. And thirdly, uh, it carries products uh, that are more value for money. Uh, so uh, I think Alibaba is going to make investments in these directions to try to uh, reclaim some of their market share there. Uh, and uh, I think it's positive that they are trying to, uh, trying to hive off some of their uh, non-core offline assets like Sanat and in time and really focusing on the core uh, technology and e-commerce platform, you know, going back to their roots. Uh, so um, given uh, the, the amount of cash flow and cash that they have on the balance sheet, uh, I I wouldn't write them off just yet, but it remains to, uh, to be seen whether they can turn it around. I mean, is there a chance of, of some of these players, even like a potential tie-up? I mean, do you see that as a possibility between the likes of PDD and Douyin? 
Uh, I think for now, uh, it, it's uh, not likely. Uh, the user scale of uh, both companies are basically uh, uh, close to uh, like a billion, and they have covered the whole market. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a very large overlap between uh, the, the number of users that they have. So I think that uh, would actually reduce any synergies that they can gen uh, generate out of a tie-up. Um, cloud business didn't look too good either. I mean, we did eke out some gains. Um, is there a real risk yeah. now that the cloud business you know, growth could actually continue to deteriorate? The cloud business has not been growing very well over the last uh, couple of quarters. Uh, there's always been uh, some excuse, uh, if you will. Uh, in the earlier quarters, it was about uh, uh, an overseas uh, customer uh, not using their services anymore. And now it's about uh, reducing low margin contracts. But they, they state that uh, the public uh, cloud services segment is still growing uh, quite strongly. But I think uh, uh, the company is trying really uh, to refocus uh, their resources onto this part of the business, which they consider to be very core, um, seeing that they are not spinning it off anymore uh, from the announcement last quarter. Mm -hmm. And they've put uh, Eddie the CEO in charge of it as well. So uh, it, it's something that yeah. they're focusing on, but uh, again, uh, there are uncertainties there. Uh, yeah, uh, but it brings me to the, the reorganization, right? So the cloud IPO, that didn't work out. They talked about they're, they're not in a hurry for listing Chai now or free Shippo. I mean, what yeah. is the path for now for, for one plus six plus N? Yeah. No, I think uh, with the new management, you, you got to re remember that a lot of uh, uh, the strategy about restructuring was actually announced uh, when uh, Daniel Zhang was the CEO. So with the new CEO, all of these uh, uh, have to be relooked. And I think it kind of makes sense. Uh, well, last night, Joe Tai was uh, saying that the, the idea is to return value to the shareholders, and it may not be the best uh, way to do it. Now, given market conditions are depressing uh, the valuations of these uh, these business units, and instead they've really you know stepped up uh, on share buy buybacks and they've announced an uh, annual dividend uh, as well, which uh, returns considerable amount of cash uh, to shareholders. I think I, uh, my view is that uh, that's uh, probably a better way of doing it than splitting up the business. All right. I want to broaden things out a little bit more uh, in terms of themes among China tech for 2024. What, what could be some surprises that you're looking out for this year? Yeah, I think uh, th there are opportunities. Uh, well, first of all, uh, in the event uh, of a market rebound, it's quite likely that the tech companies uh, being listed in the US and being mo uh, more well-known brands would actually re rebound and recover faster than other sectors. And uh, secondly, there are still companies uh, within the tech sector that are enjoying secular growth. Uh, a lot of these companies uh, have overseas exposure, uh, which uh, um, it, it offer better growth opportunities than uh, the saturated market domestically. Uh, a lot of these companies cater to uh, consumption downgrade, for example. And so uh, there, there are opportunities, but we have to be uh, quite selective about them. All right, Vaser, great to have you and happy Lunar New Year holiday. Vaser Ling, their managing director at UBP. Uh, we're checking the pre-market when it comes to Alibaba shares. Should be opening any second now here, of course, as we saw that big drop uh, in the U.S. after those results did come out. Uh, you know, obviously we're, we're facing some headwinds here on whether what uh, investors are looking at. Uh, so far, no movement yet on the stock, but what indicated could be set to open lower this morning. Uh, the Remedy Fix just crossing here right now in the last few minutes, 71063. Uh, that is quite a strong fix here. It's about 800 pips to the upside uh, from what estimates are. So another strong fix there. Uh, obviously, we have seen the dollar China uh, get back to those 720 levels as well. So something to keep in mind as well. All right. We're going to have plenty more to go. There you go. Alibaba opening up. We're down some 5%. This is Bloomberg. Some stories that we're tracking for you in China today. The Biden administration is planning a new effort to prevent foreign adversaries from assessing American sensitive personal data. Sources say the president may sign an order as soon as next week. Now, we're told the plan focuses on preventing China in particular from assessing data, including information on individuals' finances, genetic makeup and voice patterns. 
The head of ByteDance's China operations is stepping down a week after the company said it needed to make up lost ground in AI. Now, Kelly Zhang is leaving as the head of Douyin, the Chinese version of TikTok. Bloomberg has learned that ByteDance will not seek to appoint a successor. In a company-wide meeting last month, the CEO Liang Rubo said that ByteDance needed more urgency to catch up in the AI space. All right, check a look at the pre-market here right now. We talk about Alibaba shares are falling this morning after those earnings. So we'll see how HS Tech pairs this morning. Uh, it looks like the Hang Seng is starting things off in the pre-market to the downside, down six tenths of one percent. We're still talking about the CSI 300, though, on track for you know a shortened week, but a week that has seen the most gains since basically when China abandoned COVID zero back in November 2022. So certainly there's been a lot of hope of, of the market measures and the support measures coming through this new CSRC regulator that's been replaced as well. What does this mean after the 10-day break is one thing. History tells us, though, when you take a look at how trading looks like the last trading day and the first day from Lunar New Year, it's actually kind of a mixed picture. So momentum going to the Lunar New Year may not necessarily carry through, basically, to the year of the dragon. So is it a time to really take profits ahead of the holiday? That's going to be a key question here. Or is there still that pent up anticipation for more support that can continue this rally after the Lunar Year holiday? We'll see, right? Analyst actions here today. Alibaba, there's one um, from uh, Macquarie there, cut to neutral at the bank with a price target of 84.20 now. JP Morgan coming out with an interesting note on some of the battery makers in China. Uh, CATL, out of all of them, was the only one that remained neutral. The rest are underweight. That price card has been slashed, though, to 170 yuan. Talking about consolidation still a ways off here right now. Yunnan Energy, uh, part of that as well with HSBC, a new cut to hold as as well. Take a look at when it comes to the agenda here today. So turnover volumes, we'll see certainly if we see maybe more activity leading up to the end of the trading day, you know, holiday or into Lunar Year holiday. Um, we're watching inflation data as well. Could that actually derail things a little bit further here if we continue to see prices in negative territory? Alibaba certainly is the big one here in terms of earnings. The brokerages, so with this new appointment of the CSRC head, Wu Ching, uh, also known as the broker butcher, what does this mean for some of these brokerages here? What sort of forceful measures could he bring to arrest some of these stock declines that we've seen? Property, there was some contracted sales at a country garden. Sales down 75% from year on year. So that's really, that picture hasn't changed as well. Shenzhen also coming out with some new measures as well. And we're looking a look at when it comes to Alibaba. There you go. We're down about 5%. Yum China, we were up double digits yesterday on the back of their earnings. We're coming off that just slightly here today. We're watching, of course, some of these securities brokerages. Uh, Guolian up 1.3%. Seems to be at least getting a lift for some of the brokerage here. Uh, chip stocks as well. Uh, there was a TSMC sales that came out uh, strong. Also, ARM earnings. That outlook is lifting some of these chip stocks. Hua Hong Semi up 1%. That lockup period for that stock also ending. The Open is next. You're watching Blue Markets China Open. Uh, two things that we're waiting for here. Obviously, the market reaction from the new CRC head, uh, Wu Qing becoming the top of the securities regulator here. Yi Huiman has been replaced. How much you know, confidence can he restore in his market? That certainly is going to be the first test. And what's the honeymoon period going to be like for Mr. Wu? Certainly that's one thing to watch here. Hang Seng is actually lower here this morning. A50 futures, though, are still in the green. Will that inflation print sort of derail the optimism leading up to this Lunar New Year holiday, which has been fading, you know, the last few days as well. So certainly that's one to watch here today. If we continue to see persistent deflation, what does that mean for the economic recovery? And when do we actually see things turn around? Uh, but we are expecting uh, their Alibaba numbers, which have been pretty bad for the stock here this morning. There's some disappointment there, that buyback, upsize and everything, not enough to really offset some of the weakness that we're seeing in the core business, especially when it came to e-commerce, you know, the market share 
with Do Ying and, and some of these short form players are certainly video players are certainly being encroached now. You take a look at when it comes to HS Tech, though, that's lower by half of 1%. Alibaba, there he goes, down some 5% here this morning. Hang Seng has seen that red. We're down just six tenths of 1%, but we're expecting a little bit more volatility coming through here, given the fact that that inflation number could come out any second now. Uh, iron ore is doing quite well. Commodities are catching a bit here this morning. You are actually seeing the renminbi catch uh, also a bit. We're at 720.42. There was a strong fix from the, from the PBOC. CSI 1000. So the short caps, small caps, you're seeing a bit of divergence here, right? The, the CSI 2000 continues to be on a downtrend. We're up about 1% for the CSI 1000 here. Chinex is doing well in Shenzhen here this morning and doing better than what we're seeing when it comes to Shanghai as well as in Hong Kong. If you take a look at sector by sector, uh, this is how things are playing out. There were some property measures that were relaxed in Shenzhen, so we're watching the property developers very closely. Uh, catching a bid here this morning. Uh, it's a mixed picture, though. Financials are, are flat. Those inflation numbers just crossing the Bloomberg right now. Ouch. Um, it's negative 0.8%. For CPI, so this is worse than expected, and also marking a fourth straight month of inflation in negative territory. So uh, we're waiting for those PPI numbers, slightly better than expected. We're still talking about contraction of two and a half percent. So that marks 16 months of deflation when it comes to those producer prices as well. Joining us now is Helen Chow, Chief Greater China Economist at Bofa Global Research. What do we make of this? The story is not really changing in any way right now. Not exactly in the direction, but I have to say that the minus 0.8 percent is a slight miss. So relative to our expectation of 0.6, it is a little bit worse. But I would say that it is against a high base because the Lunar New Year effect is coming in. Last year, the Lunar New Year starts from uh, late uh, Jan, the and the dates were changed. Yes. yes, correct. So we are expecting some sequential, you know, kind of pickup in food prices because compared to December, people are starting to prepare for their Lunar New Year right now already uh, to work the end of Jan and early Feb, but that wouldn't be as strong as, for example, what we saw in last Jan, well, in Jan 2023. So I think that Lunar New Year effect is a probably part to blame. But that said, the overall, you know, inflationary pressure is probably very weak. We're also not going to get a whole lot of data maybe from now until March, right, just given the Lunar New Year effects and all that. I mean, what, what sort of visibility are you seeing of when things are really going to start bottoming out for the economy? Well, we're keeping our fingers crossed for second quarter because we think that not only the, the base is going to get a bit lower, yeah. but also, you know, the policy easing measures are going to start to kick in. So we think that infrastructure investment, for example, Sanda Xiangmu, uh, the three projects, the social housing, the urban, you know, village uh, renovation, as well as the, uh, the, the infrastructure, infrastructure build out for regular and emergency uses. So those are probably going to be deployed and better implemented as we speak in the first quarter and therefore by second quarter that will start to show up better. Yep. Um, so just that line crossing right now where consumer prices are falling at the fastest pace since September 2009. Helen Chow talking about the seasonal effects of all this given the Lunar Year holiday. What do you think gets us out of this deflationary spiral? Well, we are expecting that the, uh, the, the demand, overall aggregate demand, has to, uh, to come back. But uh, I would say that at the moment, consumption is probably what we're hoping for in the near future to, to, to be more resilient. But on top of that, I think what really comes back is that we need to see more in investment momentum. So we understand that the property-related investment is pretty weak. So the hope right now is for manufacturing-related and infrastructure-related uh, investment. So on top of that, if we put in social housing construction, then we can probably see that the investment demand is coming back a bit better. Mm -hmm. So combined with that, the domestic demand, you know, on the consumption side and the investment side will probably look better to lift the overall inflationary pressure a bit higher. Given just the stimulus measures we've seen so far, I'm guessing normally we would have seen a bit of a more of a turn of the, of the economy by now. We, we're still struggling to find that. Does this just goes to show how different the cycle is? From, from the past? Well, so I, I would say it is very different from the previous times, yes. indeed. But partly, I think it's because that the policy easing measures are probably harder to, to, to show up. And partly because, number one, the policy credibility is relatively low after COVID. Uh, people have uh, less expectation about the implementation. And second, people are also, you know, seeing that uh, the in terms of the positive incentives for government officials, SOEs to implement something being extremely low. So there's 
a lot of downside risks for not doing something or even doing something, but there's not too much upside risk for you know any particular policy action. So as a result, we think that the policy seems to be less effective so far, and it takes longer than usual to kick in. What would be most effective right now in terms of what you want? You, you, what would you prescribe at the moment to be the most effective policy tool? We would prefer to see a bit more combination of uh, demand side as well as the supply side policy stimulus. Mm. But at the moment, I think that the, in terms of where the policy is going instead of should be going, I, we probably are still seeing more on the supply side, meaning that infrastructure related investment, etc., to create jobs, create income, that will be very helpful. But at the moment, that may not be enough. So we're hoping to see a bit more on the demand side, including, but you know, not limited to, for example, giving out some cash to low-income family, uh, families just of, to support their consumption. But at the moment, we do not see too much of, uh, of a bias from the policymakers towards that direction. Mm -hmm. So we think that we need to keep saying that this is important. Um, to what extent do you think this, the, the inflation or deflation that we're seeing in China, is that being exported, do you think, to the rest of the world right now? Uh, that is probably not <laughs> happening. Mm. We actually just published a report on this, specifically uh, addressing the question because people are seeing, oh, you know, made in China products. Last year I bought, bought it at one dollar. Now it becomes eighty cents. Huh. So isn't that you know the deflation exported overseas? Yeah. Uh, that's not exactly the case. Even if you see some manufactured goods prices coming down, actually at the same time service prices may go up at where you bought those things. Right. In other words, in the U.S., in Europe, or any anywhere else, actually your central bank is more responsible for controlling the inflation in your economies rather than the Chinese exports. Not to mention that the Chinese exported manufactured goods is only a small fraction of what overall, uh, you know, the consumption basket is. And, and this brings me to my next question. I mean, it's a big election year and the U.S. election certainly could be the big uh, highlight, I'm guessing. What impact do you think that could have on the Chinese economy? Well, um, I would say some uncertainty, but I would say uh, some investors generally are expecting that uh, um, you know China would probably keep the uh, the, the relationship at a, a relatively uh, a back burner place, not to necessarily you know engage in too much of a, of a, let's say close distance talks, because at the moment I guess the U.S. Uh, you know uh, policymakers are also busy with their own agenda, and therefore I would say that right now keeping the status quo is probably. The the best. What and if Trump becomes president again? I mean, if it's Trump 2.0, he's already talking or exploring more tariffs. Well, I would say this, Yvonne. Yeah. Last time, uh, I think that we wrote 37 installments of the uh, China-U.S. trade war series. Wow. Uh, so uh, maybe another 37 to go. We've got to end. I mean, we have credit numbers that we're, we're, could be coming out during the holiday break. I mean, what are you expecting when it comes to credit growth? Um, well, you know, we are we are actually hoping to see a little bit of improvement because this is January. Usually, there is this uh, this this uh, tradition that in January and also Feb, that's the time when you know the banks want to make the loans as soon as possible and then try to get the interest of pay, payment um, you know as soon as possible. Mm. But that said, um, you know that four four uh, um, sorry three three two two kind of uh, breakout from the first quarter to the last quarter now is no longer the rule to go after because uh, the credit demand has been extremely weak. Mm -hmm. And uh, we heard that uh, you know, the banks are now struggling to find some good projects as well. So despite the, 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 the efforts that the PBOC have put in with a triple R cut and everything, we are not necessarily going to see a huge boom of credit probably for Jen. So you know, that all said, let's put Jen and Feb combined yeah. to take a look. Yeah. And wait for the second quarter. Helen, it's great to have you. Have a great holiday. Helen Chow there, Chief Greater China Economist at BOFA Global Research. Uh, just checking markets here, of course, uh, after the things opened up here. So obviously there was a bit of a miss here when it comes to the inflation numbers. Uh, we are seeing the Hang Seng uh, in negative territory. We're down about six tenths of one percent. Marginal increases, though. We're still seeing the CSI 300 catching a bit here this morning. In terms of some of the movers that we're tracking, Alibaba certainly is front and center. So uh, the, you know, the earnings picture was 
was a miss. There was a bigger buyback, but that's not helping the stock. We're down 5.5% here this morning. Country Garden came out with con contracted sales, but there has been some good news on the Shenzhen front of them uh, with some property curves have been relaxed as well. Chip makers are rallying here this morning on the back of some of the ARM earnings and the outlook there. You also had TSMC sales that came out pretty strong. Hua Hong Semi, that lockup period, is also expiring here as well, so one thing to watch. And we're watching some of these battery makers. So JP Morgan came out, came out with a report, a pretty downbeat sort of report when it comes to some of these battery makers, basically downgrading everything to underweight and their coverage, except for CATL, which remains neutral, but slashing that price target as well, basically saying consolidation among the space still far off right now. CATL down about a third of 1%. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we are checking the yen here this morning. We're getting a little bit of movement on the back of some comments that we're hearing from the Bank of Japan, a Deputy Governor Uchida, and talking a bit more about uh, see con continuity between yield curve control and bond buying post YCC. It's natural to stop ETF buying when the price goal is in sight. No big market impact, even if the BOJ stops buying ETFs and the Japanese economy is at a big critical juncture. So that sort of language is sending dollar uh, dollar yen up this morning. So it looks to be right now seemingly looking more dovish uh, on those comments there. Uh, pass through costs will continue to wane. So those comments coming through from the deputy governor here this morning. And certainly the, the bets about when they're going to normalize is still uh, ongoing here as well. Also, we're talking about the chips this morning. And you're seeing quite a bit of movement when it comes uh, to the likes of SoftBank up some 9%. Earnings come out from that company. But Arm uh, is what we've been talking about boosting that full year profit outlook as well and we're seeing shares soar in Tokyo uh, arm holdings giving that surprisingly bullish earnings forecast beating analyst estimates as it pushes beyond smartphones to help fuel its growth let's bring in our tech editor Mayumi Nagishi she's on the line with us here uh, Mayumi maybe just tell, tell us about arm and your takeaway from these earnings well, this seems to show that ARM's push has in, out beyond smartphones is actually succeeding and that it's been able to gain market share in more lucrative areas, such as chips used in servers and data centers. Um, executives said smartphones made up only a third of the company's sales, and that was really surprising. This is a company whose fate has for years been so interlinked with the telecom technology. Um, at the same time, uh, smartphones, contain more ARM technology in each device, so that should really make a difference in royalty payments if a recovery in smartphone demand does occur. Um, ARM's chips are used really broadly, and they're kind of a macro indicator for the tech sector at large. And you could say this is one of our first indications that the hype surge behind AI may be finally translating, translating into real revenue. More companies are packing yeah, a lot certainly. more computing power into their devices, yeah. Yeah, and they were talking about the China revenue impact as well. Uh, that brings me to SoftBank. They come up with earnings a little bit later on. You know, does it bode well that you know, ARM's doing well? What about the rest of, of SoftBank? What are you watching out for today? Uh, SoftBank holds uh, about 90% of ARM shares. So, yeah, this is a big win for them. Um, if, if these levels continue, ARM could serve the function that Alibaba once did and help SoftBank get the financing and they need for whatever founder Masayoshi Son's next big bet might be. Um, their SoftBank is expected to report a really strong quarter this year. Um, well, that's against like, four quarters of pretty brutal setbacks. Um, so ARM won't contribute directly to those earnings, but SoftBank booked a huge windfall on T-Mobile. Um, in December, and it looks like startup valuations are finally improving. We'll be looking at how the, uh, the Vision Fund might be winding down some of their underperforming startups and any comments about how they mean to use this firepower next. Yeah. All right.
Mayumi, thank you, Mayumi Noguchi there, talking about SoftBank right now. The share is up uh, the most since May of 2022. We're also at those uh, 2023 highs for the stock here right now. So then we'll continue to watch how this plays out for the rest of the chip sector as well. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're taking a look at what it comes to these markets here. A day before, of course, that Lunar New Year holiday. Uh, HS Tech is slightly lower here. Uh, Hang Seng is down about 100 points or so. CSI 300, uh, we're basically flat this morning. So you're not seeing a whole lot of momentum uh, around you know, the, the prospect of, of maybe more forceful measures coming through with this new CSRC head as well. We'll see how this all plays out. It's been pretty volatile for the whole week, basically. Uh, what's been also volatile is this controversy over the superstar Lionel Messi sitting out a football game in Hong Kong on Sunday is showing no signs of ending. It turns out the Argentinian did take the field in a friendly match in Japan last night, further angering fans who missed out here. Yes. All right. Let's bring in our Bloomberg opinion columnist, Julie Rand, joining us now. You've been writing about this. Why do you think this messy situation has been so messy? Why the uproar? Well, first of all, uh, Hong Kong paid a lot of money to get Messi to come play. Uh, like, uh, you know, the, the, the stadium was like 30, 40,000 people. The, the most expensive ticket cost over 600 U.S. dollars. Even the cheapest cost 100. Hong Kong government, in addition, was promising to pay millions of uh, dollars to the sponsor uh, of the event. And then he basically just sat there and did a no-show. I mean, according to the contract, he is required to play for 45 minutes yeah. unless he's injured. That's a standard contract across the, the, this, uh, this entire preseason tour. But the thing is, he played in Saudi Arabia for 14 minutes, you know? I mean, it wasn't much, but that, that pleased the fans. And the people just felt like, okay, if you... If you, if he was playing in, say, Beijing, you know, will he still sit on the bench? Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Hong Kong government even said that, oh, you know, you don't have to play. You can just stand up and uh, interact with the fans because people were waiting for you. And he just sat on the bench the entire time. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have a statement coming through from, from Messi as well when he was speaking in Japan. Obviously, he was talking about the injury that he had. Uh, can we bring it up here, guys, right now and just show what he basically responding uh, he posted this on Weibo. I regretted not being able to play in the friendly match in Hong Kong due to a groin injury. Friends who know me well will know that I want to give my best in every game. Um, there's been a lot of backlash, I guess you could say. It's been trending on Weibo still, this issue, all week now. Um, you know, and, and, and people are just still very angry about this. Hu Xi Jing from the Global Times also was tweeting about this as well, talking about, you know, the fact that he, you know, he didn't shake John Lee's hand when he was in Hong Kong and it didn't really show that he wanted to be there. Um, there's been smiles that we've you know, seen in Japan as well. I mean, what, is, what do you think this means for the reputation of Hong Kong. I mean, we've already lost out to very key events in yeah, the region. Yes, it makes Hong Kong look really bad, right? Hong Kong is a very, very wealthy city. We have over 80 billion US dollars of fiscal reserves, which is very rare for, for governments around the world. And uh, we just look desperate and gullible, unfortunately. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the look is not good. Yeah, I, I want to switch gears now. I mean, there's two big stories happening in China, yes. which is this. Then there's the new CSRC head. Mm. Um, Wu Qing. Tell us about him and what do you make of this change? So Wu Qing started his career at CSRC and then he was uh, brought in to clean after the, the 2007 the stock market rout. And then uh, based on my, my sourcing, he, um, he, he did do a lot of cleaning up and then he, he did uh, get uh, into trouble with some powerful so uh, forces in the system. Yeah. So he was moved out of the financial regulation into uh, a pure administrative role. And then he was brought in again after the two, 2015 route and was moved out again because, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, basically he stepped out on the wrong toes. So it seems like uh, the, the promotion of Wu Qing uh, to me is that uh, he... Uh, the Chinese government is going to crack down on the so-called quant funds and the derivative uh, traders who, who they see uh, have co caused this stock rot. And uh, unfortunately, that also means that the stabilization fund that we are anticipating probably is not coming. Oh, okay. 
That's interesting as well. All right, Shuli, thank you. Shuli Ren, our Bloomberg opinion columnist there. Uh, one thing we're checking very closely on the back of this new appointment uh, is the, the brokerages, right? Given the fact that he is known as the broker butcher, given the crackdown that he had on some of these brokerages, has led to the closure of 31 firms a few years ago. That certainly is one thing. I'm actually seeing a rally here. So maybe this means the, the market is still quite optimistic that this means more forceful, more actionable sort of support measures might be coming to this market. Uh, you talk to some analysts, they're saying, the impact on brokerages is still unclear in some ways, but you take a look at CICC, we're up 7.5% in Shanghai. Hong Kong's up about 5%, those listed shares. Uh, China Galaxy Security is also up 2.5%. The rest of the market, though, it seems like we're still seeing a mixed picture across onshore and offshore with Hang Seng uh, lower by about a fifth of 1%. Now, HS Tech, though, is actually back uh, in positive territory despite what we're seeing with Alibaba shares. So uh, it is a pretty mixed picture across the board. Onshore markets looks like we could be still heading into this uh, in the green. And we are set for the biggest weekly gain when it comes to the CSI 300 since basically November of 2022. When when zero COVID was abandoned here. CSI 1000, that's where you're seeing a lot of the price action, the volatility here. We're up some 4% here right now. Chinese one-year yields are heading lower, but the 10-year has been pretty much hovering around 242. Dollar China catching a little bit of, of a, a bid here when it comes to the renminbi. Eight shares basically are flat here, and it's a mixed picture. You're not seeing a whole lot of conviction coming out of these markets, in fact, but volumes are certainly looking a little bit elevated here as as we mark the last day of trading before China enters into that 10 year, 10 year, sorry, 10 day holiday break. Inflation numbers came out. That certainly was a big headwind there. Maybe that's why we're seeing a little weakness there. But yes, the CPI price is falling at the fastest pace since September of 2009.